Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mark K. Updegrove, director of the LBJ Presidential Library. Good afternoon and welcome to the Vietnam War Summit. On May 22, 1971, as a crowd assembled on the University of Texas grounds to dedicate the LBJ Presidential Library, 2,100 anti-war protesters were kept from interrupting the proceedings by a phalanx of highway patrolmen and Texas Rangers. Still, their chance of no more war carried by high winds and accompanied by the pounding of trash can lids were clearly heard by former President Lyndon B. Johnson and his assembled guests, including then President Richard M. Nixon. It was an apt metaphor. The Vietnam War had filtered virulently into the administrations of Johnson and Nixon, just as it had that of John F. Kennedy and would that of Gerald R. Ford. When Johnson took his turn at the podium to inaugurate the library, he proclaimed, it's all here, the story of our time, with the bark off. There is no record of a mistake or an unpleasantness or a criticism that is not included in the files here. Accordingly, he wanted his library to reflect not only the triumphs of his administration, but of the failures too. And he wanted us to learn from them to build a better America. Two years ago, the LBJ Presidential Library hosted the historic Civil Rights Summit to mark the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which LBJ had championed and signed into law. Four U.S. presidents attended the conference, President Obama and former presidents George W. Bush, Clinton, and Carter, along with many civil rights heroes who paid tribute to LBJ's legacy on civil rights and those who waged the seminal civil rights movement. But just as we celebrated the feat of civil rights, it is altogether fitting that we, in keeping with President Johnson's vision for his library, take a substantive, unvarnished look at the Vietnam War, another important aspect of his legacy. Our goal is to shed new light on the war and its lessons and legacy. It is also our intent to recognize the courage and sacrifice of the men and women who served in Vietnam. The dark cloud of the Vietnam War hung dolefully over America well after the last shots were fired and the din of protests had faded over four decades ago. But the passage of years offers greater perspective and an opportunity to elucidate the complexities of a war that altered not only our history, but our perception of ourselves as a nation. To look at it with the bark off may help us to move on stronger and more united. That would have been President Johnson's hope, just as it remains ours. We open the summit this afternoon with a series of three panel discussions. In our first, Commanders-in-Chief, we will explore the role our presidents played in the war and how their leadership affected its outcome. It's my pleasure to introduce its participants. H.W. Brands is the best-selling author and professor of the University of Texas at Austin, where he holds the Jack S. Blanton Senior Chair in History. Several of his books have been bestsellers, and two, Traitor to His Class and the First American, were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. Alexander Butterfield joined the Air Force in 1949 and commanded a squadron of low-level reconnaissance aircraft in the Vietnam War, for which he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He went on to serve as Deputy Assistant to President Richard Nixon from 1969 to 1973. After serving the White House, Alex was appointed as the administrator of federal aviation, the Federal Aviation Administration. Tom Johnson was the first in the first class of White House Fellows in 1965 and remained there for the balance of President Johnson's administration to serve as his assistant. In 
Tom went on to become chief executive officer for two of America's most respected news organizations, CNN and the Los Angeles Times. He currently serves as chairman emeritus of the LBJ Foundation Board of Trustees. And finally, moderating, today, moderating today's discussion is Brian Sweeney, who became editor of Texas Monthly in 2014. In over two decades with the magazine, he has served in many roles, including as director of the magazine's political coverage. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Bill Brands, Alex Butterfield, Tom Johnson, and Brian Sweeney. Thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, my name is Brian Sweeney. It is an absolute honor to be part of this conference and to be part of this conversation with this distinguished group. Uh, I will say that I, I take particular pride in having been uh, fortunate enough to have been part of the Civil Rights Summit uh, two years ago uh, and experiencing that and the wonderful conversation, how much we learn in the community coming together uh, to be part of this. Uh, I'd like to, a to pay a special welcome and thanks to the great patriots who are here today in the audience who had served in the military overseas. Uh, to those men and women, I say thank you for being here today and being part of this, of this conversation. <laughs> The title of, of our panel, uh, for which I'm here with, with Alex and Tom and Bill, uh, to discuss is to give an overview uh, of what role the leaders in the White House played, the decisions that they made that shaped American foreign policy post-World War II, and certainly our growing and deeper involvement in Vietnam. Uh, certainly, we're going to look at that through the lens of the Johnson and Nixon administrations, as Alex had served in and as, as Tom has served in, but it would also not be right, I think, to begin this conversation without trying to frame this discussion of the deep roots that this country had played uh, in involvement in Southeast Asia. And for that, we actually have to go back to uh, the global realignment after World War II. Uh, and all the way back to the administration of President Truman. And for that, I, th I thought I would open up, Bill, with you, if that's okay, uh, as, as the uh, award-winning and noted historian on our panel, uh, just to give us a sense of what the world was like starting back then, what were the chain of events that came forward that then would have put pressure on subsequent administrations uh, to give us a sense of how leaders were thinking at that time. There were two movements that came out of World War II that collided to give American involvement in Vietnam. The first was the anti-colonial movement, the nationalist movement in large parts of Asia and Africa, where countries that had been colonies of the European powers wanted their independence. And World War II taught them that they could, they could demand independence, and they could expect to achieve it. So that was one aspect of what would be the long-running Vietnam War. The second aspect was the emerging Cold War. And the Cold War pitted the United States and its allies in the philosophy of democracy against the power of the Soviet Union and its allies in the philosophy of communism. If either of these movements had been in existence alone, then American involvement in Vietnam would either have not occurred or would have occurred quite differently. The problem for American presidents, Harry Truman first, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, and then Johnson, Nixon, and Gerald Ford, the basic problem was that in American history, the United States has typically supported anti-colonial nationalist movements. And to the extent that Ho Chi Minh was leading a nationalist movement in Vietnam, the United States was inclined to support it. And because the United States had supported Ho Chi Minh during World War II, Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese nationalists thought they had some expectation of American support after the war. But the problem was that they were not simply nationalists, they were communists. And although being communist was not a disqualification during World War II, after all, the United States had allied with the Soviet Union, the homeland of modern communism. But as the Cold War developed, American presidents felt it necessary to distance the United States from anything that had communism attached to it. So Harry Truman in 1947 gave a speech in which he outlined the Truman Doctrine that essentially said that the world was divided into two spheres. There's the sphere of democracy and the sphere of communism. And if you're on the communist side, we're against you. 
Now, Truman was not thinking about Vietnam at the time. He was thinking about Greece and Turkey. But he laid this philosophical basis for American intervention against the communist movement in Southeast Asia. The Korean War broke out in 1950, and this was not about Southeast Asia. It was about Northeast Asia. But because it seemed to heighten the threat of communism in Asia, Truman gave an order that American aid, which to that point had been flowing through the French and finding its way to Indochina, would go directly to Indochina. So that's the point when the United States first gets involved in Vietnam in any direct way. And the United States has taken the position that it is supporting the anti-communist forces in Vietnam. Dwight Eisenhower becomes president in 1953. Eisenhower had the opportunity, he had the temptation to get more deeply involved, but partly because Eisenhower was a military guy and understood what military force can accomplish and what it cannot accomplish, he contented himself, he kept his distance. The United States still supported the, the new government of South Vietnam economically and with military aid, but didn't send troops. Eisenhower leaves office, John Kennedy is now president. By this time, the, the force of the revolution in Vietnam is gaining strength, and Kennedy, lacking Eisenhower's military credentials, felt greater pressure to follow the advice of his military advisors who said, we need to send military force, greater military force into Vietnam, or we will risk losing Vietnam to communism. I'll stop here, but just say one thing. The premises on which the United States initially sided with the anti-communist forces in Vietnam were an artifact of the 1940s, when it was not outlandish to believe that communism was a unified threat to the United States, that a victory for communism anywhere was a threat to democracy everywhere. By the 1960s, that was coming into question. But because Harry Truman, and then Dwight Eisenhower, and then John Kennedy, had laid down this marker, the United States is opposing communism in Southeast Asia, then the presidents who followed, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, felt obliged to live up to that promise. I just want to reinforce uh, what has just been said. I especially would like to urge you to read a book called The Brothers. It is, I think, the finest book on how we got to where we were, and to some extent where we are, is uh, in the story of Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles actually rejected an overture from Ho Chi Minh to try to look at ways that perhaps uh, we could work together the United States and that government, and uh, it was forcefully rejected on our side, the brothers. Tom and Alex, I would like to ask you, sort of given the political service that you had, but I am curious, before you both entered the White House, uh, or working in the White House, Alex, you had been a military advisor to Secretary McNamara for uh, White House affairs in the, in the Johnson administration, but before that, obviously, you had been a veteran and you had served overseas. Uh, before you came into the crucible of the White House, I'm just curious to get a sense of what were your personal opinions about uh, the, the conflict or American foreign policy in general before then you were in a position to be working close to presidents and uh, be part of decisions or, 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 or certainly helping shape decisions. I'm just curious from a personal point of view to help confirm what Bill was saying. Mm -hmm. well, well, in my case, I had three years of junior ROTC at Lanier High for Boys in Macon, Georgia, and four years of senior ROTC at uh, the University of Georgia in Athens. And I think like so many of us, particularly those of us in the South, uh, I felt a special obligation uh, to serve. I also felt that, uh, that uh, presidents do the right thing. I really had the strong belief that our presidents do what's right for the nation. Alex? Well, I know, <clears throat> I know that presidents certainly want to do the right thing. Being human, they all try hard. <clears throat> My Vietnam experience <clears throat> really began in the fall of 59. I was the senior aide to a great guy named Rosie O'Donnell. He was a four-star Air Force uh, commander-in-chief of Pacific Air Forces. So we were home-based in Hawaii. And he said to me, 
One of your jobs, Alex, will be to see to it that we never stay on this island more than 30 days. We're based in, in Honolulu, as I may have said. So, and our beat was the Far East. The headquarters for the Far East had been in Japan earlier. So, over a 33-month period, we made eight or nine uh, trips a year to the Far East and the Philippines, and we almost always hit Vietnam <clears throat> because of it's important at that time. So this is 59, and I'd say from 59 to when I left uh, working for R Rosie O'Donnell, which was uh, May or June of 62, we visited there at least 22, 23 visits. And on each visit, we would meet with, uh, I think our ambassador then was Fred Nolting and uh, President ZM with one or two of his uh, aides from the, the, the President's staff, a general or two, big men, little men, medium-sized men, or a lot of men, <laughs> <clears throat> all generals, and Fred Nolting and General O'Donnell and, and, and me. I was like a fly on the wall. I had no expertise, no reason to be there, but I was in all of those meetings. And I remember that early flavor. Now, that's just 59, 60, 61, a little bit of 62. <clears throat> the news was never rosy. It was always, um, there'd been an, a, a surprise attack. Uh, the, the supplies were still coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There was no way of stopping them, it, it seemed. Uh, they needed a more modern type of aircraft. And so on each occasion, we would promise, that's the way I, rem I remembered, I'm sure on every one of these visits, we didn't promise something new, but we'd, we'd give them a more advanced trainer or a, some other kind of uh, light airplane or not a very fast combat airplane, because in this jungle warfare, everything was different, and radius of turn meant everything. And in an airplane, the slower it is, meaning usually the smaller it is, the less power it is, the better the radius of turn, and you can operate better over the ground forces, and that's usually what you're doing. So that's what we did. We gave them a T-28s at one time, and then on the next visit, it wasn't working out very well, and that we had said, no American pilots will be in the T-28s, they'll be all Vietnamese. Then we said, okay, well, we'll let American pilots be in the back seat, but they can't touch the controls. And then on the next meeting, that's the way it right, progressed. Right, right, right. In so, incremental, uh, incremental involvement, yeah. incremental decision making. Yeah, and, never, and when we left, it was always like, damn, I mean, you know, what, what are we gonna do? We, we recognize it as an ongoing problem. And, and this, of course, led right into the the best and the brightest era. I don't want to get ahead, but that's, sure. that's when I knew this guy. We were on the phone all the time, not, not to solve the problems in Vietnam, but just talking. He was over in the, in the White House and I was in the Pentagon. But that's when the best and, best and the brightest were doing their damnedest with this thing, trying to figure it out. No one could really get a handle on it. And one more thing I'll say is what, what our problem was, we just, underestimated, there was a little arrogance to this too, to our position. We just could not understand, we didn't know they had the resolve they had, or the persistence they had, the determination. And, oh, the uh, North Vietnamese. Uh, the, the North Vietnamese, Vietnamese the Viet Cong, right. who were the communists in the South, and the Viet Minh, who were the communists in the North. That's right. right. Well, you said two things there that I'd like to key off of, and I'll just open this up to the, to the panel in general. Uh, but in, a, in an effort to live up to this aspect of the panel to try to get inside the heads of the presidents, uh, what were they thinking at the time? What was the information that they had? What were the best options available to them? Uh, what personal uh, biases or thoughts that they bring to the table? Uh, I, I, I want to jump off of two things. One, you said that we could never quite get a handle on it. And that's one thing that I want to sort of explore a little bit is this notion of were the presidents ever really able to control the events or did control did the events control them? Were they able to make proactive decisions or make reactive decisions? The other thing you had mentioned President GM, and I think that's interesting because if you think of the national tragedy that the United States suffered with the assassination of President Kennedy, 
uh, and then President Johnson suddenly coming in into the fore. Certainly he already had his eye on certain things, incredibly important things, uh, civil rights, certainly the tax bill that had been languishing, but also managing events in, in Vietnam, uh, particularly with the coup that had happened about a month before him taking office uh, that the United States was aware of or backed or certainly had approved of or however that gets, gets defined. I think the question that I would say to the group is, can you put yourself inside President Johnson's head and begin thinking about how was he handling all of this information and what decisions did he want to make? What options were available to him, Tom? I, I want to clarify for the audience that my role during those years was primarily that of a note taker. <laughs> and during the past uh, six weeks, uh, with the help of a young Georgia Tech senior, Parrish McCall, who's with me today, I have gone through uh, several hundred of the notes that I took. Uh, my notes were transcribed, uh, were sent to the LBJ library, and it has taken uh, almost 50 years for me to get all of them. Many of them are excerpted significantly. Uh, uh, there have been deletions made by CIA and others in it, but I am relying on my notes uh, this is only a small portion of the, the notes in answering this question. Sure. Uh, and I really, uh, I don't want to count on my memory. First, about Vietnam. LBJ was terribly conflicted. He had uh, Senator Russell of Georgia, the chairman of the uh, Armed Services Committee, and others who had advised him not to get into a ground war in Asia. He had many others who believed that we had the Southeast Asia Treaty, CETO, that uh, we needed to respect. That was a treaty that bound us to come to the defense of the nations that were signatories to it. Lee Kuan Yew, who was then the leader of Singapore, conveyed clearly that he felt that all of Southeast Asia could fall if America did not protect South Vietnam. You've heard much about the, the, the so-called domino theory, right. but it was the view of many people at that time that it was more than a theory. Lee Kuan Yew being, I think, the leader of it. Now we're getting feedback if that can be brought down. Uh, President Johnson always worried about China and worried about Russia intervening on the side of the North Vietnamese, always. Particularly if the United States accidentally bombed Russian or Chinese ships in the Hanoi or Haiphong Harbor. In fact, he often said it will be a young pilot from Johnson City, Texas, <laughs> who will accidentally start World War III. Uh, the experience of Korea, where the Chinese came down in mass to support the North Koreans and Kim Il-sung uh, was was constantly uh, with him, the worry that we might, pilots might invade the Chinese airspace. It was there. LBJ anguished about that war every single day. And that is not an overstatement. The daily body counts, the calls either to or from the situation room, often at two or three o'clock in the morning to see if the carrier pilots had, had returned. A regular Tuesday lunch meeting that almost always uh, consisted of the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the CIA director, the National Security Advisor, the Press Secretary, and a note taker. <laughs> Specific bombing targets were reviewed with him. He did not want to bomb the dikes he did not wish to bomb the cities. He did not wish to bomb the food sources. Only military targets for quite a while. Deeply personal. He had two sons-in-law, Patrick Nugent and Chuck Robb, in combat zone areas, letters and tapes that were sent back to Lucy and to Linda were at times confiscated uh, 
by President Johnson or one of us. And he would listen uh, to those tapes. In one occasion, he said that the best reporter he thought he had in Vietnam at the time was then Marine Captain Charles Robb, whom we honor here today, Chuck. And then finally, he said more than once, I am damned if I do, I am damned if I don't, as he considered troop escalations, bombing halts, bombing intensification. Through it all, he wanted his commanders in the field, especially General Westmoreland, to have the troops and the munitions that he needed until with 500,000 troops on the ground, U.S. troops on the ground, General Westmoreland in 1968 asked for 200,000 more. And at that point, with the advice of particularly a group of wise men he assembled, and with then Secretary of Defense Clark Clifford, he said he would not he would not approve that request. I guess if you thought about what was his biggest single worry in the war, it was that we might have another Dien Vinh Phu, the occasion when, when the French were overrun by the North Vietnamese forces in a tragic uh, uh, situation where that base, uh, the loss of that base led in many ways to the French losing that war. Quezon was in such grave danger in 1968 with divisions of North Vietnamese troops assembled in the area. And I guess I had to look at my notes, the one that troubled me the most at the time I was sitting in the room, was that there actually was developed a contingency plan for the possible use of tactical nuclear weapons. And in, in fact, my understanding from some of the interviews that I have seen and read, I mean, close confidants to President Johnson, Governor, Governor Connolly, for example, of, among them, had suggested to him that you win the war by winning it. And if that required the use of tactical nuclear weapons, so be it. So certainly there was a wide, a wide range of advice, which is very chilling. Obviously, I can assure you from being in the room that President Johnson never, I think, would have used nuclear Sir. weapons. In fact, he demanded a written letter from all members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a formal written document, which is here in this library, from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, assuring him in writing that Quezon would not be overrun, that we had adequate uh, forces to defend it, and we actually had placed a new weapon that was a fragmentation weapon uh, that was uh, used that had much like the type of weapon that we read about today, the so-called barrel bomb, right. that blows into a million bits and all the people in its path are blown into a million bits. But that was placed into the, uh, into the troops around, around Quezon. I'd like to emphasize the importance of one of the things that Tom Johnson just said. When Lyndon Johnson took off the table, the possibility of invading North Vietnam. He basically ensured that the United States could never definitively win the war. It had to keep fighting to avoid losing the war. And Johnson did this for a very good reason, because he was in the Senate in 1950 when Harry Truman had allowed the invasion of North Korea, which had brought China into the war. And it was scary enough when China came into the war in 1950, the Korean War in 1950, but by the 1960s, China had nuclear weapons. And so if the United States found itself directly up against China in the middle of the 1960s, it could very easily have been World War III. And that's something that Johnson definitely wasn't going to go. He wasn't going to go there. I wonder if, if we have already moved the conversation forward to agree of sort of escalation and a full commitment to a land war in, in Southeast Asia. But I do wonder if we could come back maybe to sort of an earlier part of the administration uh, the, mo the momentous summer, for example, of 1964, where President Johnson um, has not yet run for election. I think he's being very careful about how he is handling things, though he has already moved ahead with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, and the tax bill. But I think on the, on, from a foreign affairs standpoint, particularly with Vietnam, uh, it was a little bit trickier to manage. But that's the summer that we had the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Um, and, and I wonder if you might, might uh, talk about 
that handling, and did that set the stage for something in terms of the way that we were explaining to the American people as to what was happening or what was not happening? Um, what later became known as, in the Johnson administration, the credibility gap, but an erosion of, the, of, of the America's belief that what they were hearing is accurate, which certainly manifested itself after the Tet Offensive, for example, uh, that the American people were not going to believe, despite being told that ultimately this was not a military victory for the North uh, or for the Viet Cong, Cong, that it was very difficult to accept that at that point. But I, is it possible to go back as you're making those foundational decisions uh, in the White House prior to the election uh, uh, and the victory over Barry Goldwater as to how you're, you begin processing this? You're a president, but maybe not fully president. You're still very much in President Kennedy's shadow uh, in the sense of wanting to, as, as he said, you know, fulfill some of the legacies that, that uh, he had set forth and didn't want to run from any commitments at that point that President Kennedy had set forth? I was not there. Okay. I arrived in 65. Right. Right. And so all of my information is based on the records that are here, the records that are at the Pentagon, the best records that are at the National Archives. Um, clearly, uh, the Tonkin incident uh, played a significant role in the decision to dramatically increase, and I think we will all go to our graves with different versions of right. that uh, event. Um, one of President Johnson's most senior aides, Larry Levinson, a very highly trusted attorney, uh, uh, reviewed that. He worked then for uh, uh, Joe Califano at the Pentagon. Um, but the, the, to understand the decision-making process and the politics of that time. I mean, with Senator Goldwater mm -hmm. taking such very strong military positions, which, as you know, were answered by the little girl pulling the petals yeah, the from, the, mm -hmm. from, from the flower as a nuclear cloud uh, erupted in the background. But, but you, you had this incredible group of uh, people who uh, where it just felt there was a, oh, we've been, in, we've been successful in virtually every war. I mean, America's military power prior to that was just so awesome. It was unbelievable. And it was still, we had the, the capability, which incidentally we never released fully in, 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 in Vietnam. But there were, of course, were the political statements that President Johnson made about not uh, having, uh, not sending American boys to fight a war that should be fought by the, the, by, the, by the Vietnamese boys, that, uh, that was a significant part of the credibility issue that we later confronted. You're, yeah. you're the expert. Well, Lyndon Johnson was a grudging cold warrior and a reluctant commander in chief. Lyndon Johnson went into politics because he had a vision for American domestic change. When he became president, he had his eyes on civil rights reform, he had his eyes on what he called the Great Society. Vietnam was something that he wanted to keep at bay. He couldn't afford to lose Vietnam because he knew that once he started losing Vietnam, he would lose Congress. Nor was he willing to go all out and say, put everything else aside, put the country on a war footing and say, this is what we need to do first. And he had two very good reasons for not doing that. One was a concern that the war in Vietnam would escalate to a war between the United States and the Soviet Union and or China. And at no point did anybody in the White House think that Vietnam was worth a war with the Soviet Union and China. And the other thing was, and this is, this is sort of why the war in Vietnam from the American perspective ultimately turned out the way it did. Johnson understood, Nixon understood, Gerald Ford understood, that the American people were willing to devote only so much in the way of resources, energy, and time to Vietnam. The basic problem was that it was very difficult to make a case that Vietnam was intrinsically uh, important right. to American security. It had some importance, but the importance lay in its relation to American credibility. If the United States has said it's going to defend South Vietnam and chooses not to or fails to do that, well, what are the Germans going to think? What are America's other allies going to think? Allies that are more important to the United States. Now, Johnson wasn't the one who had made those promises, and those promises were made by Harry Truman and by Dwight Eisenhower and followed up by John Kennedy. He was the inheritor of those promises, but because the promises had been made, 
He didn't think he could simply ignore them. Right. It would have been politically impossible for Johnson to say, you know, this is a bad place for America to be involved militarily. We're going to pull the troops home. He simply could not have done that politically. Do you all agree with that? Because I think that's one point to get to. Was it a political impossibility just to say very early on, we are going to pull out and we're going to let this remain a, a local issue, essentially, a civil war? That clearly is the way that President Johnson saw it, and that is the way that most of those that he trusted the most in the Congress and around him in his cabinet felt in, in, the, in the early stages. I should emphasize, however, that as the situation escalated, as the casualties mounted, as the shouts of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today, could even be heard in the White House by Lucy, by Linda, that the those of us yeah. who, who were there. And I'll never forget driving out one evening with him as the protesters shouted, I mean, very loudly at the limousine again, hey, hey, LBJ, how, how many kids did you kill today? He leaned over and he said, I just wish that they knew that I want peace as much as they do too. He wanted peace as much as any of the protesters. And I mean that. It was, this was not a man who was either a hawk or a dove. I mean, he was a person looking to do what was right. And he continued to say, it's not doing what's right, it's knowing what's right. And he was trying to navigate uh, through these and, and using secret channels, one of which was the Philadelphia Channel, where this relatively young professor from Harvard University uh, made contact with a group of French in Paris to conduct back-channel discussions uh, with, with Hanoi. I mean, LBJ so wanted to get Ho Chi Minh in a room and negotiate with him the same way he had been able to negotiate with Everett Dirksen and with Gerald Ford and with others to achieve a peace. I mean, he'd been accustomed to that hands-on, up tight, close, but there was, there was not, and I think each year, the will in America to stay the course continued to erode and the incredible will of the North Vietnamese, despite the loss of perhaps two million people, there was, it was an unshakable will, it appeared, coming from, from Hanoi, despite the bombings, despite the loss of life. Uh, but, 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 and I just want to say that America's troops never lost a battle. Not in Hue, not in, in Tet, I mean, and I want all of you veterans out there, this is not BS. Never did Americans' forces lose a battle in that war. There were setbacks and there were huge casualties. <laughs> but, to, but to those of you who served and died, and ser people like Jan Scruggs who served and were wounded, I mean, this nation owes you an incredible amount of, of debt, and as you visit, Thailand and Laos and Singapore and other places today, there are many people that think that communism might very well have replaced the type of democracy that finally uh, flourished. I guess we'll never know. Uh, Alex, you go ahead, please. <clears throat> well, you, your comment a while ago was about uh, the, the 64 period and Tonkin Gulf, which was uh, August fourth of uh, 64 when the two destroyers were presumably attacked there were flash cables coming in from the Maddox saying that they were under attack torpedoes the, the, in the water the Turner Joy and the Maddox uh, and that was uh, that happened to be the last day that I was there no longer Rosie O'Donnell that was 59 to 60 I was then over there uh, uh, commanding all the low and medium level reconnaissance forces actually in Southeast Asia, include Laos, Thailand, we're supposed to be flying in Laos, but Thailand, uh, 
and Vietnam. And that is the day I left. That was my final day there, the fourth. I took off at six and flew back to Okinawa, which was my home base. So I had no idea uh, of what a president's thinking might be at that time. But uh, fast forwarding to, to when I was there in uh, Washington in 65 and 6, when I knew Tom, and uh, when the best and the brightest were, as I say, doing their damnedest, <clears throat> we, had, we, had, we had felt we had no choice. We increased the size of the forces so that by 68, just prior to Nixon taking office, there were 543,000 people there, Americans in Vietnam, and, the, and we were losing 300 soldiers. A week. Say, a week. A week. 300 a week. So that president, uh, Nixon, and I've read some of the things that he wrote during the campaign, the thought processes he had during the campaign about Vietnam, he knew very well that that was going to be something huge that he right. was going to have to deal with during his presidency. Although I will say that he devoted the first couple of months to his presidency to visiting Europe, and he was sort of Europe-centric in his thinking. And only in March, I think, did he... <clears throat> Well, that, in March of 69 is when he started the secret, highly secret bombing of Cambodia, another country, and uh, that was serious business. But and we had gone in covertly earlier, but in, not bombing. Uh, well, okay, but the bombing also preceded when we put our people in a year later. I think it was April of 70. Yeah. Then our forces went in there. And yes, people were quitting the staff on principle. Right. And a number of people in the National Security Council staff quit. That was the forerunner to, and the reason for Kent State. Students all over were demonstrating. So Nixon quickly got into the, the Vietnam and Vietnam problems that, that went with it. And Kent State, of course, was huge because four, four students were, were killed. I believe it was four. And uh, that, was in, that was on May 4th of 1970. But the secret bombing started in 69, right after he took, he took office. So, uh, <clears throat> and we were, we, I, I, I used to say we were paranoid about communism, ever, really ever since the Cold War. We were sort of, today we don't think of it very seriously at all. I, I don't, I don't at all. But, uh, uh, we did then, based on the theory that international communism insists on communist, communism being universal. Well, if it's universal, right. that is to say, then we are for the overthrow of your country. And that's the reason that we tried to avoid, if we can, these little countries slipping in and becoming communists. If your neighbor became communist, the, the thought was that all the more chance that Laos would then fall. While I'm saying that, I came across a letter, the most interesting thing I've, I've ever seen. No, it was a speech that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, te that uh, John Kennedy gave back when he was a senator long before he was president. It was in 56. I think June 1st of 56, he was giving a speech to the Friends of Vietnam or something like that. The... the, uh, the uh, a speech given by JFK uh, to the American Confederation or Conference of the American Friends of Vietnam. And he was actually passionate about Vietnam and about President Ziem. And, and we do forget that Z, this guy Ziem was a real soldier. He did a hell of a lot of good things before we came along and started working with him. <laughs> No, I mean, he did. He's responsible. He was the first president of Vietnam, and he believed in peace, and he stood up to the communists right along. He did, and he didn't want any monkey business on his staff, everything, and he was very open about, about that. And he was the first uh, president, dating from 1955, of the Republic of Vietnam. And uh, Kennedy's speech talks about 
Vietnam being the cornerstone of democracy in Asia and Laos and Thailand and, uh, uh, and uh, Laos and Thailand and Cambodia and even Japan and the Philippines were really uh, at risk if, if, uh, if, uh, if South Vietnam didn't no. hold fast. And, and so, I should and, also say, and he was all for, and, and President Nixon and President Johnson were very much together on the first during the campaign of '68. President Nixon's positions uh, were far more aligned with President Johnson's than at times were the positions of Vice President Hubert Humphrey, uh, and there many examples of that and, and speeches that brought tension, to put it mildly, bet between uh, the Humphrey staff and, and, the, and the LBJ staff. Mm -hmm. And then as President Nixon took office, um, he continued to confer with President Johnson. He had a jet star sent to Bergstrom every Friday with a packet of material from Dr. Kissinger and, and, and from General Haig briefing papers for President Johnson to read, and the Jet Star would uh, take them back the following uh, Friday. Uh, often, though, President Johnson threw uh, Alexander Haig, Alexander Butterfield, Henry Kissinger would stay in touch with President Johnson throughout his uh, presidency, just as President Johnson conferred secretly with General Eisenhower about the war uh, on, on several occasions. Uh, there was a continuity, and you know you can argue it one way or the other, but there was a continuity at that point in many ways uh, about Vietnam. We certainly had not been willing to go with the massive B-52, but those sanctuaries contained significant numbers of North Vietnamese and, and Viet Cong who would basically go into Cambodia and Laos to refresh, rebuild, uh, and come back and re and really in sort of in, 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 with, with reinforcements to attack uh, Americans. It was a fair, seeing a, I mean, the fact that those two countries proclaimed to be neutral, uh, they, they were not neutral at all. They were, they were basically providing shelter uh, for it. It was, a, it was a very tough, it was a very tough decision to escalate. Um, and I know that many of the veterans out here, I have talked with many of them, you know, think that we should have gone absolutely to the mat uh, but, but the China issue and many others, you know, it's so far more complicated. Let's talk a little bit about 1968, which was, I, I think, ultimately a, a very dark, challenging year for the United States. Uh, we had assassinations at home. We had growing civil unrest. Uh, President Johnson gives the famous speech in March of 68, uh, saying, with peace hanging in the balance every day, he didn't believe that he should spend an hour or a day of his time uh, on, on politics and announced that he would not seek or would not accept the nomination for another term. Um, so that conversation was, was wide in the open. And I, I wonder, you know, with President Johnson having won a landslide and a mandate in 64, obviously what we saw in 68 was whisker thin between President Nixon and, and Vice President Humphrey. Uh, Alex, I wondered if your sense, and maybe even going back to what, what Bill had said, that there was, there was a political impossibility to sort of pull out at that point. Tom, you're talking about the continuity uh, between Presidents Johnson and Presidents Nixon on, 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 on Vietnam. Vietnam. Was there another way coming after that election, given how divided the country was, given how much loss of life uh, had been sustained? Was there a, a different way to go? Or, or was he obliged to, I don't, to stay I don't think the course? Uh, Nixon felt that way. He laid out very clearly uh, during his campaign in 68 for the presidency uh, uh, that he, he didn't want uh, it to be, a, uh, uh, he did not want, uh, he wanted a, a, an honorable peace. An piece. honorable end. Yeah, right, an honorable peace. Right. He, he faced, in other words, he faced up to the fact that we we're going to have to deal uh, with the Vietnamese. And his idea then, he had it in 68, and he did put it to the test. And it did seem to work. His Vietnamization plan, which he was a little slow to announce it, but uh, where we would 
we, we were, as I said, 543,000 people. We would gradually withdraw, but only as our training of the Vietnamese people and supplying them with arms and munitions and maybe better weapons and that sort of thing, <clears throat> so that they could gradually take over. And as they could do that, we'd, we'd pull out. And he did, he did do that in June of, uh, I think June 8th of 69, he pulled out 25,000, I guess was the initial right. thing. And then in September, uh, 40,000. And then, and then in uh, December, another 45,000, I think. So he pulled out about 115,000 yeah. in that first year, 69. So presumably, the Vietnamese were taking over more and more of the, uh, of the battle. But one thing that, with the, that we haven't mentioned, everyone wonders why, the, the French lost at Dien Bien Phu in 54, 54. because they, they were still trying to fight one of these set piece battles or trench warfare or something in the jungle where the Vietnamese could put uh, so many tons of, uh, on, a, on an elephant's back and go through the jungle. In other words, the jungle was used to their advantage. You could fly over there and see elephants running through those areas, Cambodia and Laos, from the air. But, uh, and we continued to do, in, in that letter I mentioned of, uh, of Kennedy's, that he, not the letter, the speech he gave in 56, praising uh, the country and commending them and commending uh, ZM, he, he likens the U.S. forces to a f volunteer fire department where they come in and they put out the fire and then they get the hell out of there and go to the next fire and they leave the people who are now homeless or something to clean up the mess and rebuild and we go on to another conflagration. Alex, and, and, I think and, and, you and I are good enough friends that I can hit you with a hardball. All right. All right. There was controversy about, uh, <laughs> clearly there was controversy about uh, the, <laughs> this one. In 68, we were working to get the parties to the conference table in Paris. Um, then, for sort of unexplained reasons, the South Vietnamese pulled back and showed reluctance. Can you tell us today, and you were not there, you were not there in the campaign of 68. You, were, you came later in the right. into the White House. That's right. Tell us about the Chenault episode and what do you know about it? Historians are still trying to short out, sort out. Oh, you mean about Anna Chenault? Yes. Anna Chenault. I don't know that story. I know Anna quite well, but I don't know what, <laughs> what, she, uh, what she was doing for Nixon. But what Tom she, was, is, she was delivering a message sure. for Nixon. What, what Tom is getting People at out is, there know that. is that, that being placed in and uh, having access to officials in South Vietnam, there is real question as to whether or not there was interference by the Nixon campaign yeah. in the peace process, essentially saying that if you back off of the table now and Nixon uh, is, is elected, that you will essentially get a better deal. Um, there are a lot of stories to that effect. There was one, was sort of the historian's, uh, interview that was posted on the the Nixon uh, Presidential Library website. Do you have any uh, insight into that? I mean, as to no. I, I know she ended up not speaking to Nixon. She's very upset with Richard Nixon, Anna. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't there, know that story. Something very similar was alleged against the campaign of Ronald Reagan in 1980, and right. the story was that the message had gone from the Reagan campaign to Tehran, where Americans were being held hostage. If you keep the hostages until after the election, right. you'll get a better deal from the new administration. In the case of Reagan, it's a little bit, it's quite unclear whether this had any authorization from Reagan. In the case of 1968, you didn't have to be a political genius if you were a leader of South Vietnam to think, you know, we're gonna get a new president anyway. There's no point in going out on a limb for a president who's gonna be leaving office. Let's hold off and see what we get with the new president. So I don't know exactly what was said by Anna Chenault and the people around her, but I don't think it's actually that important because 
you know, common sense would say, don't give any concessions because you're going to deal with a new president. There might be a new ball game. Yeah. I just I would add one thing about this with transition from Johnson to Nixon. Nixon had an ace up his sleeve, or at least he thought he did. Because Nixon was going to inaugurate the policy of detente, in which he was going to approach the Chinese and the Soviets separately and try to peel apart their alliance, which was, which was already fraying. The basic premise that Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower employed to justify American intervention in Vietnam to the extent that they intervened was that the communist movement in the world was essentially this monolith. And therefore, that a victory for any communist party in any part of the world was an addition to the strength of the Soviet Union, which was always the great concern of the United States. By the late 1960s, Richard Nixon was the first, as president, to acknowledge this and try to exploit it. The communist movement had fallen apart. And there was absolutely no reason to think that a communist victory in Vietnam would augment the strength of the Soviet Union. In fact, there was plenty of reason to think it might do just the opposite if the Vietnamese allied with the Chinese. And so he hoped that he could split the major communist countries and get them to withdraw their support of North Vietnam because that's what kept the North Vietnamese army in the field. They were getting resupplied from the Soviet Union from China. If Nixon could talk Moscow and Beijing into withdrawing their support from North Vietnam, then the plan of Vietnamization where American troops would pull out, but American air support and military support would continue, then that was feasible. But in fact, he never did get the Soviets and the Chinese to go along with it. And then the policy became infeasible. There's also we, one major elephant, elephant in this room, the role of the media. Uh, early on, if you were to uh, sample the American press, which I've tried to do, there was enormous support enormous support. It looked as though most of the publishers in America were very pro, uh, I would say pro-war, but really pro. And, uh, as, uh, and many of the early correspondents were reporting a more favorable story about it. But thanks to some extraordinary reporters and photographers, Peter Arnett is in this room. Absolutely. He's an example of one of the extraordinary Pulitzer Prize winning reporters for the Associated press, the incredible photographers that were there, both television photographers as well as Nick and, and, and all of those who are going to be heard from later today, those images, uh, the cover of Life magazine, but then the impact of, of, of television. Dan Rather is going to be a part of the, the, this, this program, uh, as, as you know. But as those images continued to come across on the TVs, and in the newspapers of, of, of America. Uh, it had profound impact on the policy makers, profound impact on the people uh, in the streets. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm glad that we have as much of the, of the program that's to come that Absolutely. will look at the impact of the media because it was extraordinary. And that is a, a, a nice place to leave it. We could go on for another hour easily. Uh, but we are down to the end of our time. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here for this opening panel of the Vietnam War Summit. Certainly thanks to the LBJ Presidential Library. And if you wouldn't mind, please give a big hand to Mr. Alexander Butterfield, <laughs> Mr. Tom Johnson, and to Mr. H.W. Bill Brands. Gentlemen, thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.